Hello. Hello. <laughs> that was really a really lovely introduction, thank you. I've got a feeling I'm going to shout at me a little bit. We'll maybe, we'll maybe turn this off if it's too loud. Tell me if it's too loud. Um, it was going to be exam results day today, wasn't it? We were going to, we were going to find out you know, all of what we've got and all of that, and then I was going to come here and rain on that happy parade and feel like that the kind of nightmare, I guess the, the sort of a nightmare drunk uncle at the wedding or whatever it would be. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about TEP. I am going to talk a little bit about the longitudinal education outcomes stuff, the data that was released yesterday, because, because it is an indicator of the extent to which higher education is in crisis, frankly. Okay, so I'm going to focus a little bit on that. Um, um, in particular, I'm interested in your perception of working together, um, and I'm interested in, in the possibilities and impossibilities of that in the current climate, in a moment in which the reproduction of the university, the ownership of the curriculum, the relationship between the university and the public, whatever that is, the relationship between the university and the private, whatever that is, is in crisis. And it reflects a, a broader secular crisis of capitalism. So there's going to be a little bit of Marx, but don't get don't be too worried. There's going to be too much Marx in there. But a lot of my writing emerges from that field. So I'm I'm kind of critical of the current space that we're in, and my work ostensibly is around, I guess, the sociology of higher education and trying to look at what might be done differently. And, and so the pivot for this will be your your focus on working together, but it will also be, I guess, trying to look at um, the space that we're now in in a kind of critical way, and then to look at the examples of stuff that's going on externally, internally and externally, that, that might help us reframe what it is that we're doing, or we might decide that it's game over and we should all just go down to the pub or the coffee shop or whatever it is that we want to do. And, I, um, and this will be about, someone probably needs to throw something at me, about half an hour. I'm going, I intend to stop after about half an hour because we need some questions or we just need to head off, okay. So as I say, this, for me, one of the interesting things is the extent to which there are possibilities and impossibilities in the current moment for, for, for this idea of working together. I post up here just three images. The, the, the top left there, you remember this, is the anarcho panda from the student, um, right, the student protests in Quebec around, in, around about a decade ago, at the start of this decade, kind of that, that moment of, um, of a playful student effectively confronting the state and the, dis the disciplinary arm of the state, which we might view in terms of, I don't know, the police, but we might also view, for instance, in terms of fees, and we might also view in terms of indentured study and what it is that we're demanding of young people now when they kind of come into our spaces for learning. And well, what does that mean about the way in which our universities and our curricula relate to our young people? In particular, then, on the right-hand side, there are two images. The top one is from, um, is from the really open university's attempt to reimagine the university based at Leeds in 2010. This is a group of, um, of, of students who were, who, were, who were at the time of the Brown Review. So the, the guy with the, with, the, with the big fishing net is Brown, effectively, I guess, kind of chasing down or hunting down um, uh, the future of our sort of young people. So they're really trying to think about the ways in which we govern and regulate higher education, but also the way in which we frame content and the way in which we frame the curriculum and its purpose. What is its purpose? And then the, the bottom there is, uh, is, is an image from um, around the Sorbonne area of Paris that I took earlier this year, which kind of intrigued me ostensibly because there's quite a lot of conversation now about intergenerational injustice. And so what is the relationship between our young people and ourselves and uh, an older generation in terms of our relationship to how we manage austerity, how we manage debt, how we try and get the show back on the road and what is the role of the university in that. So um, I guess as part of this, I'm not necessarily going to pick up specifically on four pathways that are in your, um, that are in your conference themes. They're really important to me because, of the, not because just broadly looking at them, they, they potentially say what every institution is going to say, right? But actually digging down underneath in terms of the questions that are being asked, there's some very critical questions that are being asked as part of this conference about the, about the, part, about the nature of partnership potentially between staff and students, between staff, students and external partners, between staff, students, governing bodies, 
private partners, whatever they might be, and what therefore does the what therefore does the university look like? Because we're in a moment, for me, we're in a moment of where the use value, the social value that we that we perceive we've got for higher education for the university. So I want to come in, come in, come in, come in. Come in. Yeah. Don't feel awful. We're just all going to stay out here. It's nice to see you. So we're in that moment where moving from where we're moving from what we perceive because we came into this, or most of us, I guess, I hope, came into this because because we have a sense of the social value, the use value, and it's interesting that Julie talked about the value of higher education, and there's now going to be an opening up of well, well, what is that then? What is that? Because actually, there are a number of a number of organisations, corporations, of, of private providers who are circling around, and effectively, we could argue that that higher education, in higher education now, it's exchange value. It is not use value. That is, that is driver, that is the overarching sort of driver for, the, for our relationships between ourselves and our students, but also between the institution and, and external partners. So for me, one of the interesting things is that, that if we look at educational innovation, in particular the role of, of I don't know, of, um, of, of corporations, we might think of, of corporations like Blackboard, for instance, um, or corporations like Turnitin, for instance, or educational publishers like McGraw-Hill, or whoever it is, who are, who are effectively enabling an entrepreneurial reconfiguring of the university. So it isn't just the university, right? It's not just public and private. It's the university brought to you in association with. The university is just a node. This is why the whole public-private thing, kind of, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have much truck with, because the university is only ever an, a node in, an, in, a, in a transnational network. So one of your pathways is, transnational partnerships, well those trans the overarching transnational partnerships are with educational publishers, they're with, they're with um, companies like Blackboard, they're, they're with McGraw-Hill, they're with Pearson, who want to sort of crack open the curriculum in terms of the provision of content, the provision of proctoring, the provision of um, educational services, so all of those things. Um, now for me that's really interesting because, we, because it might enable the work that Julie's, sorry I wanted to the, the word that Julie talked about earlier in terms of how do we think about the value of higher education. At the moment, I'm not telling you that this exchange value as a new normal thing is, is a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing, but I'm not saying, I'm not going to say to you it's a bad thing, but it does enable us. It's a terrain upon which we might have a, have a more meaningful conversation with students and their parents who are, who are currently having to invest a monumental mortgage before they get a mortgage about, well, what is the, what is the value of this then for you? And are there, are there alternatives? So, I'm kind of interested in this question. Because this sits inside Brexit, but it sits inside climate change, it sits inside the, the IPCC working group's argument that, you know, it's, it, we have to do something now, effectively, in terms of re-engineering the, re the, our, our economy, re-engineering our society. But I don't hear a lot, but that, but that agenda is gone. Effectively, inside universities and outside, we might we might pay lip service to it, but we're not engaging our students as researchers in trying to develop, well, trying to think about what what might we do differently. And then we have the crisis of we have austerity, and I guess the, the the last couple of weeks and the last couple of days have, have argued that well, that's back on the table now. So what kind of conversations are we having there with our students? And in particular, in this, I guess I I think about the curriculum quite a lot in this, and what does the curriculum mean, and what might we do inside? What might the curriculum be a vehicle? Four. And um, inside, you'll remember this, right? Inside footnote four of chapter 15 of volume one of Capital. <laughs> so we've all, we've all, we all remember that. We, we, can, we can break that. Marx talks about technology and what technology does and what technology shows us. It's very clear in terms of thinking about what technology shows us about the world. When it breaks down, David Harvey talks about it breaking down into these seven areas. And I think that these seven areas actually are really interesting for us to think about in terms of the way in which we frame our curricula and the way in which we work with our students and the way in which we try to engage them. It was really interesting on Julie's second slide where you where, where from the EP and, and HEA report affected the idea of you've got a, you've got a separation out of students as, uh, of teachers as, as as academics as teachers or researchers. There's a, there's a separation out there, and there's no sense within that of a conversation necessarily. I mean, I, I recognise it's just one moment of that report. There's no, there's no sense that actually we might dissolve the boundary between academics and students in some way, so that, so that actually it becomes a, a community, a scholarly community of practice again, so that we think about ways in which students and staff 
you want to come in? Come in. We, we think about ways in which um, students and staff can work together on as scholars co-producing something different. So for me in this, there's something, I'm going to come back to number two, right? Relations to nature and the environment. I'm going to come back to that. And also number four, mental conceptions of the world. But some of this is about, some of these principles I think are really interesting for us to think about in terms of how do we define the governance of the curriculum, what goes on in the classroom, what goes on outside, how we assess stuff, what our relationship is to our students, how do we co-produce content, all of that kind of stuff. And is there a possibility in which, inside which we can equalize, inside which we can come up with shared solutions? And one of these, this is really interesting because in this current moment, because we outsource too many, we outsource too many of our, our, our possible solutions to experts, be they politicians or be they academics or be they whoever. But actually, and one of the themes that I'll be talking about in a moment is, is something called mass intellectuality. And it's a, it's a moment of trying to dissolve those boundaries to, to suggest that in this, moment, in this moment of social crisis, we solve these issues together. This is the money school representing greed on the south transept of Lincoln Cathedral, right? So, so for me, this is what dominates. This is what dominates the university. And the university is really important to me because I've worked in it since forever, right? Other than six months doing furniture removals, this is, the university is my kind of space. <coughs> Do I want to talk about this? What time is it? No, I don't really. I don't think I do. I've already said all of this, haven't I? I've already said all of this. The top one's the one for me, really. I've written about this, right? So, the way in which the university, all I'm going to say is the way the university is being, is being subsumed. Effectively, we thought it was one thing. People like me, who came into it, you know, 20, 30 years ago, thought it did one thing. But, but this means that it's being re-engineered into something else. Okay, for people like me, that's really it's anxiety inducing. You know, I, I, feel, I feel very anxious, I've written about this, I feel anxious about this. Right? So, for me, in terms of moving beyond or thinking about what, what we might do differently, there's no separating this out from the fact that we're folded inside a systemic crisis of capitalism, inside which we cannot get stable forms of accumulation back on track. We throw precarious contracts, we throw zero hour contracts, we force students to take on extra debt, we force them to take on multiple jobs. We, we have next to zero interest rates, we have quantitative easing, we still can't get the show back on the road. And the university's folded inside of that logic. And for me, that's uh, for me that we can't escape from that. So, I just want to talk a little bit about the kind of political realities, and I want to talk a little bit about Leo, as Julie, as Julie said, because this is the way in which the university, for me, this is the way in which the university is folded inside. Um, of that crisis and the way in which it makes working together a very different proposition for us. So this is Joe Johnson um, after the Lords had um, after the after the Lords had been discussing the um, the Higher Education and Research Bill earlier in the year. He's very clear um, that this that that higher education is about human capital. That it that effectively now if we come down to the next one, it's about students and their families, students and their families that the Tory party are very clear about this, that this is an investment by um, students and their families in the human capital of, their, of, of that individual student. And again, we're talking about value for money here. So, so, it's, a, so it's actually the value, the value for money argument is effectively being driven in as a wedge through things like the tech into the curriculum, into the classroom. So it becomes a kind of normalizing thing. And, and Johnson and, the, and the, the proponents of the bill are very clear about this, and there's a lineage back to David Willis, but there's a lineage equally back to um, Milton Friedman in, in his essay in 1955 on education and the state. And there's a lineage right the way back there that, that situates um, uni university education or any form of education as a development of human capital and very clearly as a, as a positional good. And the idea here really... Um, we're not going to tell universities what, what or how to teach. We're not going to tell you what or how to teach. That's good of them. We will demand that university teaching delivers good outcomes, and that is predicated on employability. Anything else is just frippery, frankly. You know, this is the kind of the, the reality: is that everything is about economic, is about economic value. So the rules of the game, the, the kind of perception, has kind of has shifted in that moment. That then becomes really interesting in terms of. Leo, in terms of the longitudinal education outcomes data. So in, 20, in 2015, uh, let's not do that. In 2015, 
the, the government passed a small um, enterprise employability bill. Um, inside that, they made it clear. So there was a there was a, um, a subsection on education evaluation. They made it very clear that they wanted to link taxation data to uh, welfare and social security and then to education outcomes. And they would like, ideally, to be able to do this through from nursery right the way through. Okay, so you can track an individual. You can track an individual's performance. You can track, ostensibly, the rel their reliability or the risk that will pertain to the institution or actually to the government that they will repay, that they will repay their loans, or will they not? Um, so, as it says here, um, and this is kind of, this is about human capital investment. It's a new performance metric, and, and actually it's an interesting one, because the TEP obviously is potentially going to flip a few things, and there's potentially an inversion of, of, of social and, and um, uh, intellectual capital, you know, so you'll see what you'll see the four or five Russell Group institutions that are going to get wrong will be railing about this, and railing about benchmarking, and railing about all of that, but there's a potential inversion there, and, and a moment to discuss some alternative things. The interesting thing is that actually the, the LEO data show, will, 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 will then, because it's not benchmarked, will, will then um, show that, those, that students who are going to those Russell Group institutions are earning more, effectively, when they come out. Now, there's all sorts of other disparities in there at the moment. In particular, we should be asking questions about gender and gender disparities, because effectively women are, com women are coming out massively um, uh, disenfranchised in that, through, throughout in terms of earnings. They haven't released data on ethnicity, but there are questions to be asked about ethnicity in that space as well, in terms of, sort of, in terms of the, those outcomes. But basically there's a real tension here between, at the moment between the ways in which institutions will, will use the LEO data versus how they might use TEF data. And there's a potential tension. However, of course, the TEF wishes to break that down into subjects moving forward. And what we'll see, I, I guess, is a potential alignment of, of, of TEF and LEO, so that what you're effectively looking at getting is a way of increasing competition in the, it, across the sector, massively ramping up competition across the sector. Um, this is from the, this is from the uh, Small Business Enterprise Employability Act. The measures will help to create an incentive and reward structure at universities by distinguishing those that are delivering the strongest enterprise ethos and the labour market outcomes. That's the new normal. That's the new normal. Um, and you should, you should read Andrew McGettigan's work. If you don't know it, you should read it. And there's a, if you Google McGettigan, Keel, there was there's a video on YouTube from the last couple of days. It's like a 45 minute talk which goes into more detail about this. Um, and I commend it to you. One of the reasons why that's interesting is you also have a number of venture capitalists and you have a number of other companies. I'll just put two up here, right? This is Bain and Company on the bottom left. Um, they wrote a brilliant piece called The World Awash with Money in 2012, which talks about cracking higher education, like wanting to break higher education in order to be able to extract value from it. Pearson talk about there being a five and a half trillion dollar market in, um, in higher education. How can they extract more value from that? And they want to do it through, uh, they have a, they have a, a program called um, Efficacy, effectively. So uh, Michael Barber, who's now going to be the, the head of the Office for Students, he was the, he was the kind of main guy at Pearson. He was part, he was part of the new Labour government's drive for deliverology. It's a lovely thing, isn't it? Anyway, so, that, so you also, we also see that we're, we're seeing um, much more these kinds of organisations um, swimming around, swimming around the, the system. We might not see them, but they're there all the time, you know. And, and in trying to sell services in and in trying to reconfigure the space that we're in, and that includes the content, that includes the, the assessment, that includes proctoring, that includes um, the learning analytics and data mining that comes out of, that play, out of those spaces, we're being recalibrated all the time in that moment. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, I don't think. I was going to talk a little bit about automation and whether the world that we're, that we're proposing, that we're trying to sell, the employability world that we're trying to sell to our students is actually going to be there or not. I think that's kind of up for grabs, you know. But there's a big question there for, about whether this is a, just one big Ponzi scheme, you know. So I think that the, I'll just... Uh, but Keynes was writing about this um, in 1930. You should read that. It's a great, um, it's a great essay. It's not good so the way we, what time is it? Okay, let's wrap up. Blather. Um, these are two things that I've written relatively recently or been involved in relatively recently. Um, 
The mass intellectuality thing is, is part of the Bloomsbury series on um, democratic leadership in higher education and includes a number of case studies that effectively try to, try to ask the question of whether there's an alternative way of doing things or whether we are just stuck with the games up, whether we're just stuck with what we've got. The second thing on dismantling the curriculum in higher education attempts to take some of the outcome interested in it. Two, two white professors effectively attempting to look at um, Black Lives Matters and um, Rhodes Must Fall in particular and to ask critical questions about the nature of the curriculum in higher education and who is disenfranchised in that moment and who might and what how we might do things differently. Now let's not talk about that or that. Five minutes we've got. Part of that, let's we'll talk about that. Part of this is important for me because it's about boundaries and barriers, right? It's about what goes on inside the university and outside. So Harry Cleaver here at the University of Texas, he writes quite clearly about, um, about the, I, the idea that um, all of those, any of those binaries are being dissolved, the binaries between school and factory, factory and community. There's quite a, an interesting strain of work that goes on that, re, that effectively regards um, the generation of value is occurring across society. It isn't just occurring in factories anymore. It occurs across the whole of society and therefore we need to respond at the level of society. And that includes our interactions from inside the university or inside schools beyond into the fabric of society. And, and there are questions then to be asked about, well, where is the seat of knowledge? Who, who has the privilege of kind of producing knowledge? Do we just outsource all of our solutions and the production of knowledge to the university, or might we do things different? Might, might we be doing things in partnership in order to dissolve some of those boundaries and in order to solve some of those problems of climate change or austerity or poverty or whatever social justice, whatever it is, that we might be wanting to think about things across a wider social terrain than simply our relationship with staff and students inside the institution. That was quite, this is quite, this is a, this is an image from um, the occupation at London Stock Exchange in 2011. There was some discussion going on around the formation of a cooperative, a national cooperative university that would be based on kind of cooperative principles, um, principles of the international kind of cooperative um, uh, college. It's interesting that they were talking, this is just an image from that, they were talking about it being a factory of ideas, right? That's interesting, a factory of ideas. That's outside. Right, the generation of ideas, but also that it's about you know these, this is about gen this is about generating stuff for those who would regard themselves as uh, jobless and homeless. So that's going on. That's going on. That's distinctly outside the institution. There's this other stuff that's been going on, kind of I guess, which bridges the inside and the outside of the institution. The one of them, the most um, uh, famous, I guess, would be the Social Science Centre in Lincoln, which would which is. Which, which was set up in 2010, um, 29, 2010, as a, as a kind of a response to Brown, effectively, and to the defunding of the social sciences. Um, so it was set up by a group of scholars who wanted to do something grounded in an actual place, because place is really important, so it's, it's deliberately in Lincoln. And it is, it is not just a space in which you deliver courses, it is a space in which you define the way in which the space is going to work. So the governance of the space, what we're doing about childcare, what are we doing about, about food, what are we doing about where this place, where this meets, as well as well, what are the courses that we want to put on and how do we co-negotiate those so that they enable people to meaningfully address the issues and problems in their lives. And some of those are around finance and some of those are around issues to do with social justice and some of those are to do with um, basic literacy, but some of them are to do with the sociological imagination as well. You know, there's a range of stuff going on in that space. And they're based on they're based on these principles, you know. They're based on a rich sense of alternative histories that are outside of education, that are outside the university, that are cooperative. That they're based on democratic governance, where we discuss the principles that are going on inside the in, inside the space that we're in, and we're constantly talking about those. Where there's a social focus for collective work, you know, a very clear social focus. But there are some problems we want to address. Now, in this moment, that's employability, right? That's, that's getting our students jobs, but actually it might be something different. Um, and that these, these moments very clearly connect outside the university to other, other, other spaces that we might call commons, right? Where we might be able to share resources, where we might, we might be able to share solutions. They aren't bounded in, inside a course textbook or bounded inside a particular classroom at 9 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. They're about something else. Now, I just very briefly want to mention, because like, I'm going over time now, aren't I? 
Yeah. Uh, you're going to be shut now. Let me just do. Let me just do one thing. This is really challenging, I think, for all of us. Um, but everything that emerged out of the Black Lives Matters campaign, with some of fetishizing it, I'm not saying it's perfect, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that, um, that, that this is the utopian solution, right? And I know, and we know that there's a lot of work going on, say Kingston, in partnership with six other universities, has, is, is as part of a hefty project, is trying to grow its work on um, good honors degrees for, for black, Asian, minority, ethnic students. It's got a value added tool and it's got its inclusive curriculum framework and it's trying to move that agenda forward. That's at one end, for me, that's at one end of a curriculum, but it also includes, also includes these questions, which force us to ask, why is my professor black and why is my curriculum white? And I think that this is really, this is really challenging, I think, and this is from a um, Why is my curriculum white collective, which was published in 2015, it then kind of morphs into things like wrote into um, Rosemus 4, which are, is asking why, why we have cultural symbols that reinforce a particular, inside institutions like universities that reinforce particular ways of thinking. And some of that also emerges in terms of the way in which we reflect on knowledge production, the ways in which we reproduce and who we reproduce that curriculum for and with. And does that enable us? And is that, what does that mean in terms of working together? If we're, if, we're, if we're reproducing standard, normalized ways of working that got us into this mess in the first place. So I come back to this, and I guess that's my number four here. Right? What are the mental conceptions of the world that we wish to take forward inside our curriculum, and do they enable us to do something more useful or more valuable, and how do we decide what that is? And I think that, I think that thinking about people who are othered in our curriculum enables us a little bit more to, to challenge our own positions and to challenge the solutions that we have. Don't want to talk about that or that or that or that. Want to talk about that? I'm, I'm only going to leave us with this, really. All this stuff's online, right? Some of blog, richard-hall.org. So all the slides are up there. Um, talks uh, too much about political economy way too much about that and the, and the mess that we're in. But actually there's a moment for us, this is the last thing I'll say, this is from Bell Hooks, a kind of academic activist um, in, the, in this woman of colour in the state. Who is a, it's an attempt to return us back to, to what, what we might do in the classroom, pivoting around love and dignity and care, rather than pivoting around the rule of money. And in the moment in which out, we're being told by the government that the rule of money dominates and educational outcomes dominate and human, the generation of human capital above all else dominates. I think it's incumbent on us all to kind of think about well, what does that do to us in the classroom and what does that do to our relationships in the classroom and is any of this possible? I'm shutting up, George. Thank you very much, Richard.